All right, good evening, everybody. We are in lesson number five in our discipleship classes. And uh, one of the things that I, I hope we're kind of sensing as we approach these classes is that if you imagine being somebody following Jesus when he was doing his earthly ministry, and you would listen to the things he said and try to pay attention to, to his interactions with people, and you knew that your job was to try to become like him, that you'd be noticing a lot of things in his life that um, would have some kind of effect on the way that you think about what it means to serve God. One of the things that Jesus will do uh, several times in the Gospels is he'll give some kind of purpose statement on why he came here. And if I'm somebody who's seeking to imitate Jesus, I'm going to be trying to pay attention to the things that he said, I came for this reason. And that's going to say something about what my purpose is as well. Uh, and we'll work towards that as in this class as we get to that. If you do need the material, um, it's not going to be as necessary that you have it tonight. You want me to announce your material? So I'll do that right now. So uh, Matt Finley's class material for Hebrews is in the back over there. Good. Anything else on that? We're good? Yeah, get ready for Kizzy. All right. Um, so uh, we're in these lessons, lessons four through eight on discipleship. We're just looking at different things in the life of Jesus, things that he said, things that he did, that if you were following him, you'd, we would hope to pay attention to those things and then try to seek to imitate those things in our life. So last week we looked at Jesus' singular focus of seeking to please the Father and how that ought to be our singular focus as well. Here we're going to look at some of these statements. Uh, three of them are in the Gospels and two of them um, are not statements that Jesus explicitly made in some of the writings of John, though one of them is in the Gospels. But uh, I'll explain how we're going to do this in just a second. Let's do a little bit of, uh, bit of review though. Uh, what is the definition of discipleship that we've been using in this class? Learner and of Jesus. Yeah, a learner and follower of Jesus, um, a, a learner who follows, a follower who learns. And the reason that we're using follower and learner is because sometimes we can maybe polarize those two things, where there's some people that just want to study, 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 learn, 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 but they're not as good at at putting into practice the things that they're learning. And then there's other people that are like, let's just go do a bunch of good deeds, but they're not always the best Bible students. And so Jesus wants us to combine both of these things. And a true discipleship is going to be holistic in that way. What are some of the purposes of discipleship? Spread yeah, spread the gospel. In the definition of it, we already got the first two. Learn from Jesus, become like Jesus, and then to reproduce after... Um, our own kind, kind of like Genesis chapter 1. Jesus says that in the Great Commission uh, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. The reason that we're doing these classes is, number one, to cultivate a deeper resolve to follow Jesus uh, and to look at Jesus' life and let that be a mirror to our hearts and ask ourselves, do we really have the same kind of resolve that Jesus wanted us to have and try to correct some of those things in our life that maybe aren't what they ought to be. Um, but then be challenged by Jesus' example and then learn how to learn better. The last five classes are going to be about um, methods of Bible study. And so um, any comments or questions just by way of introduction to what we're looking at tonight before we start looking at this particular lesson? Okay, if you look at question number two... There's only two questions on the material for tonight, and um, I want to start with the last question and then go backwards, but uh, I have this question relating to John chapter 20, verses 20 and 21, and I just want to put this up on the PowerPoint right now, and this is Jesus after he's resurrected, and uh, the text says this, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Now, I understand that Jesus is saying this to the apostles, but, he, but what he says to them is, 
just as the Father sent me, I'm sending you out. Now, there's going to be certain things that Jesus came to do that the apostles were supposed to imitate that we do not imitate. Can you think of any examples of those things? Yeah, like healing people would be one example, right? Like there's going to be certain things that are unique to the apostles, a lot of things that are unique to the apostles, like we're also not revealing new scripture like they were. But there's going to be a lot of things that the apostles were supposed to do as they looked at Jesus' example that we're supposed to imitate as well. So whenever Jesus says, I came for this reason, I came for this reason, I came for that reason, and then at the end of the Gospel of John, he says, as I was sent, so are you being sent out. In other words, the purpose statements of Jesus are going to say something about our purpose statements as well. And we're going to use that as kind of the foundational key to everything that we look at for the rest of this class. Do you guys have any comments or questions on that idea? All right. Um, so what we're going to do then is I'm going to break up everybody into uh, three groups. And the way that I'm going to do this, because it's easier visually, so these two sections will be group one. The middle section will be group two, and then the sections over here are going to be group three, so you can see that visually. And that's going to be your guy. So group one, your assigned text is Mark 1, 35 to 39. Middle group, Mark 10, 42 to 45. The group over here, Luke 19, 1 through 10. And in every one of these passages, Jesus will say something about his purpose. And I want, I'm going to give you guys like five or so minutes Talk to the people next to you. So last week, um, we did it where you guys had your like, moment of silence, your five minutes of silence to look at it individually. Take the time with the people next to you to talk about your assigned text. And I want you to think about these questions together. And maybe these aren't the best questions to ask. Maybe you guys can think of better questions to share when we break it open into a bigger group discussion. But think about these questions. Number one, why did Jesus come in your particular text? Number two, uh, what does this mean? Uh, uh, what does this mean? Jesus' mission was not. So, if he says this is my mission, it would it would rule out the opposite of what he's talking about there. And then, thirdly, um, how can we imitate Jesus' purpose? So, do you guys understand what we're doing then with each group and everything? So you got group one, group two, group three. So I'll give you guys around five minutes. Talk about it amongst each other. Read the text together and think about these things together. And then we'll break it open into a bigger group.
All right, let's come back together. So let's, uh, let's just go through each group, and um, you guys can share what, whatever it is that you guys discussed from each group. But let's go ahead and let, we'll read uh, the first text in Mark 1, 35 to 39, and then we'll hear from this group first what they noticed together. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. All right, what did you guys discuss, group number one, with that text? Yeah, good. So he came to preach. And in the context, uh, what is it that people are wanting Jesus to do? Yeah. Jesus, the day before, like in um, Mark chapter 1, verses 32 to 34, he was healing a bunch of people. Jesus goes to bed that night at Peter's house. People are knocking at the door of Peter's house the next morning or something. And uh, they have to do, like, the search party to find Jesus. And they say, hey, Jesus, there's a bunch of other people that would like to be healed. I think we should go back to them. And what does Jesus say? We, yeah, we need to keep going. We need to go to other places. So what is Jesus walking away from in Mark chapter 1? Yeah, people who need physical healings. Like, he's leaving behind a bunch of people that have got a lot of physical problems because there was some other greater priority that he came out for, and that was to preach. So, um, look at this second question, then. What does this mean Jesus' mission was not? Yeah, it wasn't to physically heal everybody. Now, I believe that when our resurrected bodies are resurrected, it's going to be perfectly healthy and, and all those sorts of things. So the miracles, in a sense, are sort of like a sample that you'd get at Sam's Club of something greater that you could purchase. Um, but it's just a sample. But during his earthly ministry, he did not come to heal every ailment or solve... Uh, what else would that rule out, I guess? So if his mission was to preach, are there other things today that people say, well, this is what Jesus was all about. He was all about... That would be, yeah, that would be the right answer. But what would be some things that people like attach Jesus to that he never said was his purpose? What was that? Right, like, like the physical needs of people. He would do those things at times, right? What was the purpose for doing those things? What was that? Yeah, yeah, they were signs pointing to a deeper reality. That's why in John chapter 6, the next day that people are coming back for more food, he says, you didn't, you didn't come out to me because you saw the sign. You came out because you just wanted your fill. And so it was supposed to point to a deeper reality. But here, can you imagine Jesus literally walking away? Maybe there's people that you can hear in the back, like in the town that he's leaving, like wailing and screaming and crying because of their physical ailments. And Jesus is walking away from it because there's something more important to do. And that's the preaching and teaching of the gospel. Did you guys have any other thoughts or comments on, on that one? Yeah, yeah, and we saw him, you see him in the synagogues earlier in 121 to 28. He's going to different ones. He's still casting out demons. He's still doing some of that kind of work. But yeah, Jim? That's right. Right, like can you imagine, here's one of your closest disciples. You guys are still kind of getting to know each other, I know. But like, he's like, hey, we, we, 
There's a search party. We did all this effort to get you to come back here. And Jesus isn't swayed by what people want him to do. He's just like one track mind going to do exactly what it is that the fathers asked him to do in that regard. I remember when I was in college, uh, I don't know if I've told this story here or not. But when I was in college, I took a political science class. And there, the teacher that I had was, um, he was, he had a guest speaker to come and talk about a certain political persuasion known as Marxism. And the teacher, the guy, the guest speaker was going on and on about Marxism. And I, as a new college student, I didn't know about any of these things. So I raised my hand and I said, where did you get your ideas from? And he said, well, from Jesus. I'm, like, I'm pretty sure that that's not why he came. Like I was a new Christian and I'm, I, don't, I don't think that he came to set up some kind of political, do some kind of political overhaul of anything or anything like that. Now, let's, do you guys, did you guys have any other observations that you wanted to make from this? Absolutely. Right. So like Mark chapter 1 verse 41 would be one of those examples with the, the leper where he was moved with pity or compassion. So I'm not saying he didn't do these things only as a sign. He did these things because he did love people. Can you imagine, though, having the ability to just heal everybody? But, and you do them in certain occasions, which brings up a question then, like social gospel kind of stuff. Like, should Christians be involved in helping the needs of people in the world? What extent should we be involved in those kinds of matters? When we have statements like Jesus saying here, and what, what do you guys think about that? I think the motive is what it all comes down to. So if the motive is to heal them physically and provide for them physically, then that's the wrong motive. If by providing the gospel, we may also help them out a little bit as far as like, meet at a Bible study to like buy them a meal or process or something, then we're fulfilling both. It's, it's okay to do that as a compliment. Right, like I think there's a sense in which if there's another human being that is like going to die or like has a, a real physical need, I, I think it's appropriate for Christians to help. Obviously it can't come from the church treasury money, right? Yeah, Brian? Right. Yeah, John 5 is another example of that with the guy that was lame for 38 years. So good. Right. And then the debate is, are they helping brother, brothers and sisters in Christ? Right. It, um, so I will say that all the times in the New Testament, whenever there's a collection given, every single time the collection for needy people is always given to people who are Christians, right? Every single time. There's no exception to that. But Jim, were you going to say something? Right. And what's interesting to me in the context of Acts 3 6, Peter says, uh, Silver and gold we don't have for you. Well, what was happening in Acts 2 42 to 47? Uh, people were give, selling everything and distributing it at the feet of the apostles. Yeah, right, Peter. You, there's a bunch of resources you could go back and get. Now, I'll say this um, whenever I was at another church, when I was working at another church, um, there was a deacon that was assigned to needy people in the community. 
And, and he would organize other people that he knew had um, the financial ability to take up a separate collection for somebody that had some kind of need. And what the deacon told me, he said, all right, Eric, when you're having Bible studies with people during the week, you're going to run into people that have some kind of physical need. Your job is to just teach them the Bible. If they start asking for anything, tell, give them my phone number and I deal with that so that you don't have to get that muddied up with also studying the Bible. We make those two separate things. Your job is to just teach. But there were people that had a collection for people that really did have legitimate needs and they made this whole document at this church on like this is the protocol that we go to through to know if this is a legitimate need and we would then talk to those four or five people that are okay uh, helping people in this situation. I don't think Christians are against that. I think what we're against is using church treasury money in an unscriptural way. Jim? That's right. Right. Well, and what you don't see Peter doing either is, hey, can I, let me give you $1,000. Now would you like to study the Bible with me? That, that seems almost kind of manipulative. Um, what you see happening in the book of Acts is you see Christians taking care of each other and then the world looking at that and going, there's something different about that community. Uh, that's at least the pattern you see in the Bible with that. So um, I, the reason that I think this is a powerful passage is as Christians, we might, we could get distracted with social gospel stuff and miss that this is the priority. And, we're, I'm, and I'm saying that I'm not saying to not help people, but this is the priority. Any, com any other comments or questions on that one? Yeah. Right. And, and I've had Bible studies with people before that did have legitimate needs. We helped those people as we continued to study. There's times to do that. So, but I think, so, I, I guess one thing that I'm concerned with, with um, the, you know the pendulum swinging from generation to generation, that perhaps there is a generation, I don't know, I didn't grow up with this. These are just things that I've heard. That perhaps there is a generation that emphasized so much, we only teach the gospel and we never help people, that the pendulum could swing all the way to the other side, that we say, well, we're just going to go help a bunch of people, and, and, um, and we're going to not emphasize teaching as much as we ought to. And I think there's a balance to this. Um, so anyways, any other thoughts or comments on any of that? Uh, yeah, over here. Right, yes. And, and one question, like, yeah, okay. Well, okay, so because Mark 1 is closely related to Luke 19, there's some similarities and differences. Let me swing over to this group and see what they have to add with the story of Zacchaeus. Let's go ahead and read Luke 19, 1 through 10, and then we'll finish by looking at group number 2 um, in a few m minutes here. But look at Luke 19. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on, on account of the crowd, he could not see because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. 
And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone into the get, to be a guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. So look, at he's helping people. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a, man of, a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. All right, what did you guys get uh, in, in your thoughts when looking at this text? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the statement, the purpose statement in verse 10, I came to seek and save the lost. Can you imagine if Jesus' disciples were around him and he says earlier in his ministry, I came to preach, I came to seek and save the lost. I like that he uses the, the word seek and save. Now, there would be some things to say about that, but what else did you guys notice in this text here? Right, and, and, and Jesus is the one who's come there. He is salvation. He's come to the house, so that's kind of a cool thing to see there. What else did you guys notice in this text? Yeah, Erthel? Yeah, this also connects to, um, like, the theme of the crowds in the Gospels. The crowds are oftentimes a barrier to people who have real, genuine faith, and they have to look past the crowd. The crowd could be, like, today people who are not totally committed to Jesus but kind of crowd up around him on Sundays and like the hypocritical kind of people or the people that are not really zealous, you got to look past those people and see the treasure of Jesus. This guy does that. And Jesus, uh, when he uses the word seek and save, he doesn't say, all right, um, I don't think Jesus would have said, all right, uh, the community knows where the truth is taught, is taught because we got a sign. And people can go read the sign that we teach the Bible here. And so if they want to come to the, know the truth, they can just come here because the sign was there. Now, it's fine to have a sign if the sign helps bring people, whatever. That's another tool, I guess. But Jesus um, said he went out to seek and save. What do you guys make of that? Yeah. Right. That's right. Yep, that's right. Very good. Good. So if Jesus came to seek and save the lost, what does that mean Jesus' mission was not? And we already had this conversation to some extent, but I'm curious what you guys thought about with this. Yeah, like his mission was not to just hang around people who are already saved all the time, right? We need encouragement from one another, but the salt shakers, like if the salt just stays in the salt shaker, it's not going to preserve anything, is an imagery that a lot of people have used. Yeah, Jim? And saving his skin was the last thing on his mind. Did what? Saving his skin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't come to preserve my life. I didn't come to save myself. I didn't come to save the Roman Empire, or to save the Jewish nation in a physical kind of way. I didn't come to bring social reform. I didn't come to... There's a bunch of things that you could list out um, along these lines. But any other thoughts or comments you guys had on this one? And here's a rich guy, right? Zacchaeus, that's one example. Jesus would 
go and study with anybody. There was no group of people that he was like, oh, I don't like rich people, or I don't like poor people, or I don't like people from this part of Galilee. or wh-. Anybody he would study with. Um, Californians. Uh, <laughs> anything else you guys want to say about that? Yeah, Wes? That's right. One of the elders at the church in California, like every time he led a public prayer, he would always say, God, please send us seekers. I'm like, that's a good prayer. I like that one. Yeah, Jim. What verse is that? What does your version say? It says, if I obtain anything from any man by false accusation. Like, as if there's false accusations against him? Yeah. Yeah. I never noticed that. That's a good observation. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Um, now, I keep saying I want to start these evangelism workshops on Saturdays every now and then, and um, we can talk more about how we would imitate Jesus' example in that. But like starting up spiritual conversations with people, um, there's a lot of ways that we could address that. But I, I don't want to neglect group two here with the text you guys had. So let's go back to Mark 10. And by the way, before we leave group one and two, or one and three, one of the reasons that I think this is important to bring this up is because of social gospel kinds of things. I'm not against helping people, but the priority of the Christian is what? Yeah, the spiritual care of somebody. Um, yeah, David? Amen. Amen. For sure. Well, and, and what? So Tom Holland is an atheist who wrote a book called "It's Not Bat uh, Superman." Or what? What is it? Spider Man, not the Spider Man actor. Um, Tom Holland is an atheist. He wrote a book called Dominion. And the book is all about the positive influences of Christianity throughout world history since Christianity started. It's a really interesting book. Um, But one of the things that he points out is like whenever there were plagues in the Roman Empire, the the non-Christians were the ones that would leave mom and dad. Like, I'm not going to touch them because I could die. Guess what kind of people were the ones that were going and aiding the poor and the sick and sometimes getting the same sicknesses? They were the Christians. Or the way that they would abort kids back then is the baby would be born and they would throw them into a ditch. Guess who the only group of people were that started in mass saving those children? It was Christians. And, and nobody had ever seen that kind of care or concern for people in world history. And so the teachings of Jesus to love other people and to seek the preservation of their life was something that's left a a lasting imprint on the way that our society today thinks about morality and helping others. And so, yeah, if you're a Christian, you'll obviously, like if there's a baby dying on the side of the road, of course you're going to go and save that baby. And when people are not used to that kind of thing, it's going to make a big impression, right? So, So if you're a Christian, yeah, like when the tornadoes came through, Um, There were people that were donating generators for people. If your neighbor needed a generator and you had the money to give them one, but they weren't a Christian, would you have got it for them? Yeah, like those would be good things to do. Like nobody's saying that that would be a bad thing to do. Um, The thing that gets hard is when you're the one who has to do it. Are you willing to do it? Or are you just going to complain that we as Christians don't help non-Christians enough? Are you going to go do it? So, all right, um, group number two. 
Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are consider, considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and that their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. All right, what was Jesus' purpose in this text, group number two? Serve. To serve. All right, what does that mean his mission was not? Yeah, to be an earthly king, to be served. Like, he, of all the people that have ever lived, he's the only one that had the right to be carried by people and have the um, big leaf as a fan back then, and then people, like, give me grapes, and then people would give... He's the only guy that ever had the right to ever treat anybody like that. Yeah. The leaf thing? Yeah. Yes. That's right. And the way, so when we think of the word serve, we can oftentimes think about um, not what he said in Mark 1 or not what he said in, in Luke 19. Part of the way that Jesus said I was serving was by teaching and by preaching and by seeking and saving the lost. And so I came to serve. So... Um, if, if I'm following Jesus, and in this context, James and John are asking to sit at Jesus' right and left hand, give us positions of authority and glory. And Jesus says, that's not what this is about. It's not about how many people are under you and how many people you influence. It's about how many people uh, you're serving. Yeah, you guys don't, yeah. Because on his right and his left hand when he was crucified, you don't want those positions. Uh, yeah, so I hand back here. Right. So let's ask this question then. How can we imitate this today? How do we serve others? One of them we've already talked about. Like if you've got a neighbor or somebody that's in need, and not, even if they're not, a, not, if they're not a Christian, yeah, go help them. Don't use your treasury money for it. That's very clearly outlined for us in Scripture. But yeah, go, you can serve people in that way. What else could you do to serve people? Yes. Yeah, getting to under like that means hearing them out and not coming to people like assuming that you've got like this great understanding of everything going on in them. That means a lot of listening, which takes effort and energy to do that. Good, Wes. Yes, good. Good. There might there are certain things that we have the right before God to do, but if it's going to cause somebody else to stumble, uh, or if I need to give up a weeknight to help so and so with something, like, are we willing to make sacrifices like that to help other people? Because that's what Jesus did for us, so we have every motivation to do it for others. What else did you guys do? You guys think about this question? Yeah, Gerald. Yep. Yep. Right. Right. So in my family, before Samantha and I were married, our 10-year anniversary is in 13 days. Um, before Samantha and I got married... Um, there had been some divorces in my extended family, and then I was up next to bat. Like, I was the next one to get married in the extended family. And my mom said, I'm really not worried about you and Samantha. And I said, oh, why? And she said, I'm just not worried about you guys. I'm like, okay, well, tell me why. 
And she finally said, because you guys have God and a good foundation. Okay. So you see, like, why these things are working out this way. Um, and so far, we're doing pretty good. So I still hate you, though. Um, uh, all right. Um, that was a joke from a couple weeks ago. Any other thoughts or comments on any of these things we've discussed tonight? Yeah, Wes? Wes? That's very good, yeah. Yeah, there's all kind of connections there with Daniel, and he serves, but then becomes the one that served through his service that he did for other people. Matt? Oh, I'm sorry, sweetheart. What is it, my love? <laughs> Right. And as, they, as the message of the gospel went out and, like, valuing people made in the image of God, like, that has had tremendous impact throughout world history. But it wasn't because that was the mission. Um, so, yeah, but you don't see that as, like, a big emphasis in the book of Acts, even though the Roman Empire was wicked and, uh, and all that kind of thing. Good. Anything else? Yeah. That's right. Did we talk about the Jeffrey Dahmer conversion in this class? We did, yeah. Um, we, we're like out of time, so I'm trying to like stall for 10 seconds, so this is kind of awkward right now. Um, it, was, it was fun uh, doing this tonight. It was fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, so next week we're gonna look at um, a case study in evangelism. So what we're gonna do next week is just, just simply draw lessons, any lesson you can think of, from Jesus with the woman on the, at the well about seeking and saving the lost. Just any practical things you can extract from that text about that pursuit. But I really appreciate the good discussion that we had tonight. This was a lot of fun doing this.